I'd like you to tell us a little bit about how you decided to write a book on this particular topic. Uh, well, uh, first, Adam, thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, I, I didn't sort of decide as I was just sort of compelled. Um, I had been uh, watching a, a documentary by a gentleman named Steve James uh, who directed Hoop Dreams, among other films. Uh, and this, this movie is called Stevie. And uh, to give the ending away slightly, somebody in that movie ends up in jail. It's a documentary. And uh, I was dating a, a lovely young woman at the time who was a lawyer for the Illinois uh, Corrections Department. And she said, I'm, I'm going to look this guy up. I'm going to see you know, how he's doing. And uh, after she did, I said, man, that's, that's an amazing website, just how much information is public. And she says, that's nothing. You should see what they, what they do in Texas. And Texas has this very encyclopedic website, um, you know, uh, crimes, uh, appeals, last meals, last words. Um, and I found myself reading it long after she went to bed. And uh, sort of after doing a little more digging, I, I was appalled that there was no modern study of last words. And uh, talk a little bit about the mechanics of how you compiled uh, so many uh, final statements from so many years and so many sources. Uh, the book goes all the way back to pre-colonial times. I think the first one is 1659, although I researched all the, back to, all the way back to 1608. Um, and that came from a variety of sources. Uh, things like, uh, you know, colonial newspapers, um, prison records. I talked to uh, at least two gentlemen who took last words, um, one in Texas and, and one in San Francisco. Um, and it was a lot of, you know, going through microfilm, uh, yellowing newspapers, uh, you know, just sort of shoe leather reporting. Uh, it's an interesting tradition, the final words. You, you trace it in your introduction to uh, early Christianity uh, in part as a way to allow the condemned to repent at the very end. But talk a little bit about how it came about. And also, today, uh, does everyone get a chance to give a final words? Is that up to the warden? How, how institutionalizes this tradition? Yeah, um, I mean, I didn't find a state that didn't have last words. Um, you know, actually, for years at San Quentin, they were never taken. Actually, in the in the in the prison records, uh, the only notation was whether the uh, execution was successful or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, and it's not just Christians, but modern modern uh, last words are come from a Christian tradition, and it's not only uh, again, it not only has I guess that spiritual function, but it also has a legal function. In many countries, uh, a dying declaration can be entered as evidence. Um, it also serves as the function that if someone had not yet confessed, um, th this was a final chance to, to prove the courts right and fair and just. Um, no one, very few people actually ever did that. You, you made an interesting organizational choice. You, you organized the book by methods of execution, starting with the noose, firing squad, electric chair, gas chamber, and finally lethal injection. Could you talk about why you decided to do it that way? And also, to what extent did people's last uh, uh, statements tend to refer to or correlate with the method of execution? Um, I, I mean, I had kicked this around for sort of a long time. And, and originally, um, I had it by state, actually. Um, and uh, Studs Terkel, who is a, a good friend and wrote me a very lovely introduction for the book, um, all of his quotes that he puts in his foreword are from Texas because that was the chapter I had done first. Um, I was later convinced uh, to do it pretty much chronologically. There's some overlap in the methods of execution. Um, and I think that actually works more powerfully because you get a sense of history, of oration. Um, early executions were held in the public square. Um, you know, 10,000 people would come out to see an execution. So you get a sense of someone speaking to the crowd. Um, you know, it was an event. Um, modern last words, you know, as they sort of uh, did executions behind prison walls, are far more intimate. You have people looking and talking at, uh, talking to, uh, you know, the family members of victims, to their own family. Um, so I, I think you sort of get that, that entire range of humanity um, with that arrangement. Um, your, your book does go back as early as uh, Marmaduke Stevenson, who was executed by the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1659 for disobeying a banishment order, up until uh, an execution of a man who uh, committed a double murder last year. Um, talk, if you would, about how final statements have changed over time. You mentioned in the introduction that in modern times they are often more political than they used to be. Yeah, yeah, I mean, people are far more aware of the anti-capital uh, punishment um, 
drive. Uh, many of them are involved in it. Um, I'm finding, you know, but I guess I guess I didn't do sort of a a numbers game. I won't because I, mostly I wanted to get, you know, just a range of humanity. That was that was the uh, that was the goal. But uh, yeah, they're they're more political, and again, they're just more intimate. You know, people tr talking directly to their brother or their sister or the victims' families, and that can sometimes be chilling. It's also interesting that not everyone chooses to make a final statement. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, the uh, uh, the married couple who were convicted uh, of uh, atomic espionage. They chose not to, and the final mm -hmm. words you include were uh, a statement made to their lawyer. Do you do you have any thoughts about why some people choose not to do this? Um, I mean, I, I had a couple people tell me, uh, you know, the, the folks who took last words sometimes. Uh, they feel that they're going to misquote it, to be misquoted, and they actually often are. There's the, a whole sort of back section of the book talking about how, um, you know, even in Chicago here, uh, you would have, you know, six newspapers cover an event. Everybody was in the exact same place, and they all had different versions of the last words. Um, and that's mostly a function of, you know, even today, unless you're in Georgia, there's no recorded device taking your last words. Um, so again, uh, Humans are fallible and records are fallible. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps, uh, quite a few people uh, use the last words as a chance to uh, protest their innocence up until mm -hmm. the, the bitter end, sometimes screaming, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. Uh, you mentioned one example, a guy named Roger Coleman, who bitterly protested to the end his innocence and said, you know, essentially, there's blood on your hands for killing me, I didn't commit the crime. Then, uh, that was in Virginia in 1992, then in 2006, DNA evidence actually showed that he was guilty. Yeah. So I wonder how often that's true and how often uh, when people are saying that they're innocent, they, they are and what's going on there. Right, right. Well, and um, uh, Reverend Carol Pickett, um, who is one of the gentlemen I talked to, again, he took, I think it was 98 last words in Texas. Um, and he's now an anti-death penalty advocate, by the way. Um, he, th he thought that out of the men that he uh, helped in their last 24 hours, that one of them was emphatically innocent. And he was sort of haunted by this question, you know, do the innocent die differently than the guilty? I mean, it's this question that still haunts him today. Um, my approach is actually non-political. The book does not take a political stance at all. Um, it simply raises questions. And uh, my the central driving question is, if these are the most dangerous, reviled members of society, why does it remain a cultural ritual, a cultural value to record what they say? And then what can we learn from that? A good number of, of, of the uh, people who were executed, on the other hand, uh, you know, did admit their crimes, and uh, sometimes in rather poignant terms. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they welcomed their execution. There was a mother who killed her babies and said she was glad that she was going to be reunited with them. Also a guy named Herman Ashworth, who was executed in Ohio for a brutal murder, who said, a life for a life, let it be done, and justice will be served. Um, were you surprised by, by that sub-segment of the uh, final words, the people who said, you know, I support this. The, the, those are actually sometimes the most chilling for me personally. Um, there's a, a gentleman in the book who says, you know, I deserve this. I'd kill a man for five cents. You know, um, really, really chilling. Um, interestingly, the, the last quotation that you have in the book, which is in the part of, uh, of one of the sections where you describe the crime and, and uh, that, that comes after a quotation, is actually um, uh, a quote from the families of two of the victims. Uh, this was of a, uh, uh, two people who were killed in an Oklahoma campground murder, and they said, this is the victim's families, and they said, we've waited nearly 14 years for this day. We feel justice has finally been served. Um, so it's interesting that a book about uh, final words actually ends with the words um, on behalf of the victims. Were you doing that intentionally to try to give at least a little voice to, after all, these people who, whose words make up the substance of your book are responsible for uh, a great deal of pain yeah, as well? Yeah. Well, I, actually, uh, uh, victims' voices and the, the families of victims are actually throughout the biographies in the book. Uh, again, I wanted to sort of uh, continue to be as uh, balanced and as non-political as I could be. And by the way, there's, there's no real uh, ritual for taking uh, the last statements for, for victims or victims' families. You know, that's not part of the machinery of, uh, of that particular, uh, you know, of executions. Uh, I actually suggested at one of these book readings that it should be, and I had somebody jump down my throat <laughs> and just say, no, no, we, we shouldn't because that is not the point. The point should be the focus on that life and that crime and that execution.